Evening all and welcome to episode six of the Huddy Hilly. We're uh, nearly a week into level two lockdown and as you can see in the Huddy Fuddy tonight we have Adam Julian inside the Huddy Fuddy studios. Adam, good to see you and welcome. Well I'm missing my casting couch back home but it's certainly uh, nice and warm and very exciting to be here and our guest tonight is a fascinating man with a lot of insight into the local rugby scene. Well, he certainly does, Adam, and for a rugby coach at a very young age, he has done a lot of um, great success, not only just at club rebel, uh, level, but also at representative level, and hopefully will soon at school level, and uh, our guest tonight is Kit Harris. Kit, welcome to the Huddy Hui tonight. Uh, hey guys, did, how are you? I think no worries, all good. How did you get involved in rugby coaching? Oh, gee, well... Um... I was I was playing when I was uh, at Silverstream at St Pat's and played pretty much most of my college years. And one of the the final years I had at school, I, I didn't complete my year thirteen, but in, so in year twelve was my last year, and I was uh, playing some rugby and, and had some 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 bad injuries, which put me out for the season. And uh, a local legend at the school uh, by the name of Peter Jones, who guys in Wine who will know pretty well. Uh, wrote me in to help coach one of those under 55 B teams at the school and that that was uh that was my year my final year there and uh, I loved it and the next year I signed up to take my own team and from there it just sort of kicked on what was the result for that team and can you elaborate on your injuries oh so uh, in terms of my injuries I'd had I'd had a few concussions um both from from rugby and from playing some some netball so I was in the New Zealand men's netball team and I'd taken a couple of knocks which was uh not ideal and um the the, the one that put me out uh my last rugby season was just the like a fracture in my jaw um which was uncomfortable and and so the 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 team that I coached that year was under 55 B's and I, I can't really remember how, how well things would have gone, but you know, Jonesy was taking that, and it was just it was just a cool opportunity uh, to sort of switch sides and uh, look at the game in a different way. And the following year, I took uh, an under sixty five C team, <laughs> you know, so it was uh, nothing spectacular, but uh, I guess just the opportunity to, to coach and um, and to try something different. I remember the the first training was was really daunting and and really challenging and. We ended up uh, the season though winning our winning our grade and, and beating our 65 Bs in the process and so it just the excitement and the adrenaline of coaching just sort of kicked in and it's and it's always grown since then. Do you remember the name of the girl who knocked you out in netball? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm sure she was a big one. <laughs> and with the concussion issues, can you explain how serious they were for you personally? Because as a rugby coach of some stature now you would have seen a lot of concussion. And what advice would you give to people who have been through your experience with it? Yeah, look, I mean, for myself, I don't think it was at the point where I couldn't keep playing. Um, I just, I guess there was a, an opportunity that came my way that I really embraced. And, and to be fair, I was no great rugby player. And and um, I guess I've never looked back with the opportunities that have come through coaching. But um, in terms of the concussion and for and for people playing now, like at the end of the day, as we've as we've really just sort of realised with the, the lockdown and everything, there's there's things that are more important than your sport and, and and rugby and things like that. So you know you've got to look after your players and you have to look after yourself too. Tell us the state of uh, Huddle Boys Marist at the moment, Kent, with uh, all that's gone on with uh, COVID and the lockdown. Yeah, so I still um, I still keep a, a little bit of touch with, with what's going on there, and um, hopefully can do so more this year. Um, you know, everyone's everyone's in the same boat where it's about trying to be innovative and uh, figure out ways to to keep in contact with your with your players and and try to keep a, a finger on the pulse with with their training and and eventually as we come back probably next week. You know, have a plan for how do we how do we turn things into a preseason and and reschedule everything. So, I know that um, Bus and uh, Rizzi and and, and uh, Gibbo are doing a great job of that, and it's it's all you know trial by error, and and hope that next week comes and is a, is a lot of fun for everyone. How worried are you about putting teams on the field, and can you get the club? functioning like a normal Saturday again because there are some clubs even prior to the lockdown who were really struggling was that the case for Huddle Boys Marist too? No Huddle Boys Marist is never struggling 
Um, <laughs> no, we're, we're really blessed to have such a great player base and, and also to have such, um, I guess, good support off the field. Um, and I know that not every club has been um, fortunate to have that. And I imagine it's going to be a, a difficult return for clubs to field multiple teams. Um, but, you know, I think that what we've sort of built out had over the last few years is, a, is enough of a... Uh, a backbone, I guess, to to make the transition as, as seamless as it could be. But, um, you know, it's going to be with its challenges for sure. And who knows what kind of impact it has had for the guys personally. So we just have to wait and see, I guess. Tell us about um, your involvement with Huddle Boys Marist. Of course, you started out uh, with the senior first side and spent a few years there and moved up uh, to the Premier Programme where you eventually became the head coach for the last two to three seasons. And um, tell us the highlights that you have had uh, coaching at club level. Yeah, well, I, um, it was quite a, a unique thing uh, getting into club after doing. Uh, I'd done three years with the Upper Hutt College first fifteen, and I was really looking for some, I guess, adult rugby to go and do. And uh, the opportunity to go to Huddle Boys, where I didn't really have too much of a connection going into it. Um, I took on the the senior first year, the the prim reserve team in my first year, and the guy who was meant to be the head coach uh, bailed on me for the first six months of the season. Uh, which was sort of threw me into the deep end, but it was awesome. And I only had the one year of the of that Prem Reserve side. And gee, that's probably the toughest job coaching <laughs> that I've ever experienced, particularly uh, just, you know, in terms of the management of, of getting players along and, and all of those dramas and trying to keep 22 players on the field without your Premier team nicking them. Um, but we had a really awesome season and and in the end um, managed, to, managed to win a final and, uh, that was a that was probably the highlight for me of my coaching so far was to just to, to do that um, particular season and even though the referee in that final was a little bit dicey, we managed to get over the line, eh, Mr. Hudson. Uh, yeah, it was a good <laughs> final. You know, uh, it was uh, it's probably one of the greatest games of rugby I've ever refereed, Ken, except for the spray at half time. But otherwise, yeah, it was a good final. So, are you able to repeat on the show what you said to Brad at half time? <laughs> oh. I think he probably stayed at the halfway line for the remainder of the game in the second half. So I uh, just, you know, stay there and enjoy the view. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a nice day at Batoni, Rick, that's for sure. It was uh, nice and sunny and all that. Uh, uh, yeah, so, of course... We're not talking about oh, the weather, Hudson. Uh, well, well, that's right. Uh, it's uh, been a bit cold lately. Uh, but, yeah, after that uh, time of the senior first, you then got up into the Premier Programme. Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah, so um, again, just I guess on the back end of that successful season and a, a few changes in the in the Premier Group, um, there was an opportunity to I guess we were in a, in a stage of transition um, that year with quite a, a lot of coaches and and uh, players leaving, and um, that was the year where Josh Sims uh, came along into the club, and I, I don't know, I couldn't tell you honestly whose role was what, but um, we just sort of all worked together as a, as a group, um, myself and and Bus and Josh. Uh, mostly and that was a really awesome turnaround to go with a club that had you know maybe hadn't had the greatest of starts to the year before and did a really good job of coming back to win the Harden final um but being able to make those those uh those changes and and some gains in our game and and to go on to the Jubilee final that that, that next year in 2017 was was definitely something um that I think was pretty special to be a part of. And then in 2017, you were part of the Jubilee Cup final. Didn't get the win, but tell us about the Jubilee Cup final against OPU. Would you have done anything differently as a coach? And what's it like as a young guy to contest that prestigious trophy? Yeah, it's handy when you um, get players of the likes of Wes Hoysland and all of that coming back for their sole club games of the, of the final, but they were outstanding. <laughs> And uh, you know, and Jamie does a fantastic job of with how he uh, organises that team, and it was a it was a really um, I guess an eye opener to the standard that club rugby can can be at, and something that you know I've tried to to build into our games in the in the seasons following that. Um, I think OB was a fantastic side that year, and they've continued that sort of that dominance as well um, in the seasons from that. And what's the difference coaching schoolboys and senior players? You've dealt with first 15s you've dealt with senior club sides and you've been successful in both uh, how's it different and how's it similar yeah there's there's quite a lot of similarities in both um you know i guess obviously the the standard and the and the the complication of of the of what you're coaching is is stripped back a lot with with younger players and i, and I think 
you know, the type of skills that we're encouraging are, are probably, um, you know, hopefully more, more game-based and, and trying to get them to enjoy their experiences. But I guess you can take that same stuff into clubs where you're working with guys who have, who have worked really long days and shifts and, and are there for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but I think you find with, you know, with men's rugby that guys are there because they've chosen it and they, and they want to be there to be successful. And sometimes you have to work hard to create that culture with, with younger players um, who, who might be there uh, because it's the thing to do, you know, and, and they've got a lot more options, I guess, at their, at their hands to, to be involved with things. Tell us about your coaching style, Kent. Are you uh, a calm, managed individual? <laughs> <laughs> or are you a bit like a Graham Henry rant at half time in the 2001 Lions tour? Uh, <laughs> it probably all depends. If you catch me in the coach's box all alone, you probably know, Grad, that it's um, sometimes <laughs> sometimes emotion can definitely get the better of I, me. I did see that once in a commentary last year. It did get on radio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bus has always been a, a great calming influence um, in our coaching groups. And um, yeah, there's been some, there's been some good discussions and things like that. But I'd like to think that on the whole, like if you take into account the training weeks and, and the training nights and stuff like that, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that emotion uh, would usually get the better of me, but I, I'm, I'm definitely pretty competitive and, you know, nothing like the, the thrill of a game to, to get those things going. <laughs> and what about a playing style? Obviously the personnel Hi. you have, <laughs> oh, death, yeah, I was just saying uh, in terms of a playing style I mean if you had an approach that you could implement what would it be and why is it a game built on uh, forward dominance and kicking corners or are you someone that likes to involve all 15 players and have a lot of excitement when you watch the sport yeah good question I, I, can, I think that's always going to be hopefully evolving um, you know, my, my way of approaching things hopefully will we'll continue to, to, to learn and, and to change. But I guess my main sort of philosophy is to try to fit uh, your game plan around the, the sort of players that you have. Um, and I think, you know, if, you, if we look at Huddle Boys, for example, we have traditionally been a, a, um, a really good team when it comes to getting uh, front football and but yet with a pretty exciting backline, and I and I hope that in, in in recent seasons we've we've made some big gains in um, being able to play with a little bit more width. And but I, it comes down to do you utilise the skill sets that your that your team has when you profile them. And um, the team that at the moment that I'm just doing some work with around St Bernard's first fifteen, it's it's completely different yet again, you know. And um, we don't want to we don't want to just use one style of play because that's what I like to use or, or what's the current theme at the moment. Um, yeah, hopefully you can challenge it to, to work with the players that you've got and give them an opportunity. Tell us about some of the interesting personalities you've had at Huddle Boys Mariston. How do you convince some of those back who might be having doubts in the COVID-19 situation? Maybe a guy has to go to work on Saturday. How do you convince him to come and play rugby instead? Well, I think the first phone call has to be made to, to Simon, to Mongi, because I think he's contracting half the team. And uh, at the moment, <laughs> at the moment they're working Saturdays, and if he doesn't get them stopping uh, before the season starts, we might be in trouble. <laughs> but, um, you know, like, everyone's got to do what's best for them as well, you know, and look after their families. And I know that some guys will, will need to really look at how they can manage both. And hopefully as a, as a coaching group, we can we can sort of work to put plans in place around that. So this year, Kent, you have taken on the role as a uh, first 15 coach at St. Bernard's College and also um, the director of rugby at St. Bernard's this year. Um, tell us what plans you're putting in place um, to deal with the first 15 and particularly in the unique situation uh, that college rugby is in at the moment. And uh, what are some of your aims and objectives for the season? Uh, gee, there's a, there's a lot in there. Um, I mean, I guess... I guess in terms of what what I'm trying to get out of it and why I took it on was it was something that would that worked really well with my schedule with um, meaning to to be doing the Wellington B at the end of the year and and that not that's not obviously eventuating at this stage but it just worked really well with um, the time that I could commit um, to to be able to still get around club rugby in a bit more of a neutral way and and one of the things that really stuck out to me at the end of my last season where. Uh, I'm going to call them out on this. Where Ness dropped the ball over the try line in our last game against Wainui, um, you know, is that is that you've got to have more to what you're trying to get out of coaching than winning, and that's really challenging for me as a competitive guy. And 
I've worked at St. Bernard's now coming into my fourth year and I guess it's um, it's been hard at times to see uh, the the standards and the culture that you want to have in your rugby team and at a, at a boys' school maybe not be where it could be. And so I know that there's a lot of pride in that school and it's a really exciting opportunity to, to get involved and try to do something positive and for myself just to assess what, what's important for me in coaching. And so I think the, you know, we've had a really strong preseason since the beginning, I guess, of uh, term four last year, where we've just seen a massive turnaround in, in the, the boys' attitude, um, particularly considering that half the team is year 13 and probably not returning, hopefully. Um, hopefully, hey, Brad. And, um, you know, and it's, it's just something... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's just something that we're trying to build on and, and really focus around getting those those standards and cultures right so that you know, regardless of results at the end of the year, there's something that we can be proud of. How do you compete against the wallets and the success of Scots and Silverstream and Town? Because it seems to me, <laughs> observing the first 15 rugby for a decade now, the gap between the haves and the have-nots is getting wider, regardless of the good intent of people like yourself. Yeah, what's the question in that? You're spot on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is there a way, apart from building a culture that you can compete at, is there a method that you can introduce as a coach that uh, perhaps outwits the opposition in a way that they wouldn't have think? Be yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I'm I'm um, I'm really optimistic that with our our group of boys that we, we have talent and um, we're if we're clever about how we use it then we can be successful with that and if, you know if you play to the strengths of your team you're always going to be difficult to beat but it, it, re it relies on you being organized with those with those um, game plans and, and players and boys knowing what they need to do and then being really committed to that course and that's probably something that the the other schools in, in division one and two um, struggle to 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 realise and to motivate because it's it's potentially more challenging and you have less players that are have been exposed to a higher level of rugby you know um, whereas you've got the top schools I guess you'd call them that are regularly playing top teams uh, in their traditionals and and in their Wellington 16 programs that have been exposed to that so. I don't think it's necessarily physically that you've got 15 boys who are significantly better than all the other schools. It's it's probably just how we can put them all together onto the field. It's quite different. Tell us about uh, the, the balance you have between work, uh, coaching rugby, and also the young family you have as well. How do you manage all that during the uh, winter season? Gee, um, my wife's probably best to answer that. And, uh, Look, it's, <laughs> it's challenging. Um, I've got a three-year-old girl at home and uh, another 10-year-old girl and, sorry, 10-month-old girl. And um, I, you know, I'm really lucky to have a really supportive wife that's that's helpful with um, allowing me to go and do these things. But, geez, I've, I've had to really learn how to try and use my time more wisely um, because as the, like guys like Bus and that will know that have worked to me that it's the, the time that I put into it sometimes can be over the top. And it's it's just trying to trying to find a balance with you know what what are the big things that you can change and and when is the best time to to go and, and put those time into things because I've got to try and use some more family time I guess when you know everyone is awake and everyone's ready to to have me around. Is there an end goal with your coaching? Do you want to coach the All Blacks or professional level, or are you very much satisfied with what's going on at the moment? Yeah, I'd I'd love to. Um, to, I guess coach professionally is, is how I sort of phrase it for myself. Um, you know, like I, who, who wouldn't want to coach um, those teams that you grow up idolizing and, and maybe it might come one day. But I, I think for myself, like I'd just love to be able to be employed to do this as a job and um, in the next step, maybe to, to try and target it, to target that ITM level um, at some point in the future. And, you know, but for now, it's just it's be patient and, and, and grow yourself as a coach because there's a long way to go and do that. But Hopefully, if you put the work in, then somewhere along the line, you can make it your career. Thank you very much for coming on the, the Huddy Hui tonight, Kent. Um, what you have done in your short coaching career has been pretty impressive. Uh, you've inspired a lot of rugby players and also your wisdom and calmness uh, has resulted in a lot of these players going on to further honours. So all the best uh, for uh, St. Bernard's rugby uh, this year and further down the track no doubt Adam and myself will look forward to seeing you 
in the higher levels of rugby coaching. Cheers, Brad. Cheers, Adam. And, and good job of what you guys are doing here. Hopefully uh, this continues to take off. It's a really cool concept. Awesome. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, Adam, uh, we really got an insight there into a young man in coaching rugby uh, that has achieved quite a lot in a short space of time. Very much so. Uh, and he's done it the old-fashioned way. He hasn't, as far as I'm aware, gone through the academy or university system and got all these fancy credentials that the coaches get now. He's a guy that started in the humble confines of the 55 C's at Silverstream, worked his way up to the 65 D's, and then had Upper Hutt College, which is a significant challenge, and then on to St Bernard's and Hutt Old Boys Marist, where I'm most familiar with Harris's coaching. He did a sterling job. In 2014, Hutt Old Boys Marist won the Jubilee Cup. The next year, they were playing the Hardham Cup. That is a spectacular demise, and there were a lot of shenanigans in the Hutt Old Boys Marist culture, which contributed to that collapse, and Kent with the Josh Sims, who's now in the Hawks Bay, came along and they've reconstructed a very powerful team. Last year, they made the semi-finals and some of the names in the Huddle Boys Marist team, like Jack McCormick and Jordan Gillies and Sheridan Rangi Huna and Glenn Walters, are some of the strongest players in this region. And we hope that they come back flourishing when this COVID situation terminates and Ken Harris has been a big part of their ascent to the higher echelon of Wellington rugby. And he's going to be a key builder in the recovery of Wellington rugby. He's undertaken a difficult role at St. Bernard's, galvanizing the boys there to try and get St. Bernard's back to the standards that they were. They beat Silverstream in 2012, won three Wellington premierships in their past. So St. Bernard's a fine competitor when they have the right people and the right structures in place. And good to hear too that Hard Old Boys Marist perhaps in a stronger position than some other clubs might be. They've obviously got sensible people in there making sure that things flow seamlessly. Yeah, St. Bernard's last won the Premiership, I believe, in 2001, Adam. Um, and Nick Risden uh, was playing that team that day as a uh, halfback. So speak about rugby coaches, um, you know, Coaching is quite a unique thing at any level, any sport, okay? It comes with its challenges, it comes with um, excitement and great opportunities, but there are certain individuals, Adam, uh, that su succeed well in coaching, and it's not just going out there and barking the orders at training and setting up the patterns. It's about relationship building and having a good deal of knowledge and experience about uh, how to coach young men and women. Well, it's a bit like this uh, program, Brad. I do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so um, so t tell us about um, some of the top rugby coaches in rugby you've come across in your studies and and uh, what that, those coaches may come from, local, regional or national level. Well, I remember an absolute classic when I was a high school lad at St. Pat Silverstream, an old priest by the name of Father Mark Walls and the first 15 were playing very badly in a club match at half time. In those days, he used to play in a club competition and they were well behind the side that they should have been beaten. And Father Mark Walls stormed to the school cafeteria, bought several jelly beans and threw the jelly beans at his team and then vanished to the local pub, the Charlton's across the road, and came back 35 minutes later and they'd won the game. So that's a man who obviously had considerable mana and installed a fear and perhaps a confidence in his players to get the job done. I always thought Rod McQueen, when he had the Wallabies, was an absolute yeah. genius. He completely changed the way that Australia played and they only conceded one try in winning the World Cup. Steve Hansen, the, the recent vintage, has been spectacularly successful for the All Blacks. But I think the greatest coach in rugby history is Wayne Smith. Wayne Smith, as a player, coach, and selector, has been involved in over 200 test victories. And you listen to Wayne Smith talk about the game, and he has a role for everybody, whether it's the five-year-old playing for Patarudu or Daniel Carter. He's got such a wisdom and willingness to share that with players. And it's no coincidence that when Wayne Smith left the All Blacks, 
in 2017 that things started to wane a little bit. They didn't retain the World Cup. But in 2011 and 2015, Wayne Smith was driving the back line. Before that, he had the Crusaders. They were last in the first year of the competition. That's right, they were. Wayne yeah. Smith took them to first. And Wayne Smith was also approached to coach England before Eddie Jones. So that's a hallmark of the respect that he has. Well, as well, he also uh, was All Black coach in 2000 and 2001. Then, um, unfortunately, um, missed out on the job. Um, much, much well, it's is, interesting. Is, 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 uh, yeah, because um, because he sort of indicated he would recontest the position. Was that right? Yeah. Well, he had doubts about whether he wanted to mm. coach the All Blacks, and if you have doubts about that job, you're probably not the right person for it. But it was a hallmark of the integrity of Wayne Smith, the fact that he was feeling like that and put that position forward. The last thing you would want is someone to commit to something that they don't want to do. And I suspect that time away from the All Blacks to re-energise and relearn certain aspects of his approach was probably very helpful when he did ultimately return. In your opinion, who is the greatest All Black coach in history? Well, I said uh, Wayne Smith, but Fred Allen had 14 wins in a row in test matches, but he, did, he never yeah. played South Africa, retired before the 1970 series. That doesn't diminish Fred Allen's stature as a coach, but perhaps South Africa would have been a considerable challenge for Fred Allen, given that the All Blacks did lose 3-1 in 1970. Brian Lahore was obviously a giant of the coaching scene won the world cup in 1987 and such was the respect that he had in the community that he was from in the wire rapper when the one of the local high schools up there Kurunui college was going to the yeah, dogs right. mm. he wasn't even associated with that school in any way but they bought brian lahore in to clean the place up and Kurunui, as far as i'm aware is now a flourishing school 20 years after the fact so brian lahore was an absolute genius of a coach as well well yeah Lahore especially at um not only in Wairapa Club Rugby where he coached a number of uh, um influential players and also local players and the stories of which of the best way in which he would get the best out of players and it was often the old school graft and remember uh the All Blacks of 1987 talking about their training camp on his farm and how they were pushed to the old school limit and they actually learnt a sense of humility by doing so. Well, Kent raised a very good point, and you raised a very good point in regards to Brian Lahore. The best coaches, particularly at that top level, are managers of personalities. By the time you reach the All Blacks, most of the skills, you would assume, are already conquered. The idea is to make sure that everybody gels together, and it's been fascinating watching the Michael Jordan documentary the role that Phil Jackson plays in building that brilliant Chicago Bulls team and very often Phil Jackson left the decisions to the discretion of the players but when he had to intervene he always did so in a way that was non-confrontational but effective he let Dennis Rodman take a break during the middle of the season to go to Las Vegas for 10 days. Now, only Dennis Rodman <laughs> could get away with that, but that's an innate understanding of the personality. You can't contain Dennis Rodman. Let him go, but know full well that when he comes back to you, he's going to give you 100% and help you win. He managed Michael Jordan, who was almost running the balls like a military dictatorship, and he managed to pencil all these very unique personalities together and form... Uh, team which has been the subject of a netflix documentary oh, it certainly has speak about um also famous rugby coaches particularly at sevens level sir gordon titchens um uh, over the last 24 hours has announced that he is stepping down as the coach of the samoan sevens team indicating one factor <coughs> being the delay of the uh, tokyo olympics to 2021 but also allowing the opportunity for someone else to come in and step their mark on the Samoan Rugby Sevens program. Have we seen the last of Gordon Titchens as a Sevens coach, Adam? Well, I hope not, because Gordon Titchens started with the New Zealand team in 1994, and then he's had this tenure with 
Samoa, which has been very challenging because Samoan rugby is in a desolate state. Not entirely Gordon Titchen's fault that at all. Mm. Very corrupt administration over there. And I'm a genuine believer that if Titchens has had more stability in the administration department, Samoa would have performed a lot better than they did, remembering, of course, Samoa has been a powerhouse of the seven yeah, seas yeah. in the past. Yeah. I hope that despite the fallout with Gordon Titchens after the 2016 Olympics, that New Zealand reaches out to Gordon Titchens again and is it somehow involved in the game. It might not be the top elite positions, but one talent that separated Gordon Titchens from so many other coaches for years was his ability to identify players that nobody had ever heard of That's and right. turn yeah. them into stars. I mean, he found Christian Cullen in a place called Paikokariki. So I would love to see Gordon Titchens back in the New Zealand game, maybe working with our youth where he was so good at identifying talent from places that we'd never heard of before. We've seen that in particular with youth, uh, secondary school, sevens, rugby. Uh, the in the last five years, we know rugby in general has had its issues with player retention. But in particular, sevens rugby, remember the college sport regional sevens tournament on Labor Day at Nine Eye College, and there was also the Wellington Ambassador Series. We used to bring out lots of teams. Now we're starting to see uh, teams pull out but on the day or not into teams. And a classic example of that was the Upper Hutt team that only a few years ago were the national champions. Well, that's right. And one of the challenges that Kent alluded to in his interview is the fact that rugby isn't a top priority for everybody anymore. But with people like him involved, rugby will become a stronger pursuit for the talent that exists a lot of the reason why there's such a huge drop-off in the senior years of high school and then heading into those initial years of club rugby is that there's just not the stability of administration and the support and the coaching to maintain players. Young people have higher expectations, I think, of what they want from their clubs and their coaches today, and that's fair enough. And so... They've also got more choice. So that's, that's right, another significant do. factor. So having people like Kent involved is uh, very important for the future of the game. Now, of course, Ed, you uh, worked uh, for Sky with College Rugby for a long, long time, for nearly a decade, and of which you travelled around and attended many tournaments, uh, such as the Top Four, which uh, was announced just recently that, that the Top Four Nationals is not going ahead this year. But you told me just before coming on air that you have uh, a quite a famous uh, uh, party trick. <laughs> Could you uh, tell our uh, audience what, 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 uh, what is the party trick? <laughs> well, this is something that I wasn't uh, expecting to be asked. Evidently, I think I did nine years with uh, Sky First 15 Rugby, so that would make me year 19 in mm. a uh, high school sense. Well, my previous job in a former life was uh, the statistician of the Land Rover First 15 program. I was a very faithful employee because I still acknowledge the existence of the sponsor. And one of the things I used to occasionally do when I was asked was name the winner of the top four, the finalists and the score uh, from every year since the inception of the event in 1982 and this exercise has become easier because unfortunately there's going to be no top four this year. So I'm going to give this a crack and you can check the Wikipedia page <laughs> to see if I'm hundred percent right. And if anybody does genuinely pick out an error in my recital here, I will apologize with a beer, but I did write the Wikipedia page I want. So here we go. This is a rather lame party trick. It proves why I'm still single, but there's no notes in front of me here, as you can see. Uh, this is purely from memory. So the national top four first 15 tournament started in 1982. Mount Over Grammar School beat Waitaki Boys High School by 11 to 4 in the first final. Glenn Warren scored the first try and see Solomon, a Kiwis rugby league international, was on the Mags team. In 1983, Auckland Grammar School beat St. Bede's College by 20 points to 10. 
and Strawn, halfback for Auckland Grammar School, was the first all black to score a try in the top four final. In 1984, St. Stephen's played Te Ati, and Te Ati were the winners by seven to four, four point tries in those days. In 1985, St. Stephen's School from Bombay in South Auckland, mighty South southern outfit they defeated Napier Boys High School by 26 points to three in 1986 Auckland Grammar School beat St Stephen's School by 15 points to six and Matthew Ridge was the fullback for Auckland Grammar School in 1987 Southland Boys High School was thrashed 25-7 by St Peter's College of Auckland Pat Lamb was the captain of St Peter's that day and Mana Otai became the first person to be sent off in a national top four final in 1988 Gisborne Boys High School was trailing 15-8 and came back to beat Napier Boys High School at McLean Park by 24 points to 15. In 1989, Kelston Boys High School edged Wesley College by 22 points to 19. Wesley College returned to the final in 1990, spearheaded by a fourth former Jonah Lomu playing lock and defeated Gisborne Boys High School by 21 to 6. St. Stephen's School won their last top four in 1991 by the same score by 21 to six, also against Gisborne Boys High School and Dion Muir, the New Zealand Māori was the captain. In 1992, Auckland Grammar School beat Napier Boys High School by 17 to three and Casino Door expelled from Wesley College in 1991, sure, scored a yeah. hat trick for Auckland Grammar School in <laughs> 1992. In 1993, Wesley College beat St Paul's Collegiate by 13 points to seven. In 1994, Gisborne Boys High School beat St Stephen's School by 14 points to three. Daniel Godbow was the captain. Ben O'Brien, if you were watching, <laughs> 25 and 0 Gisborne Boys High School season. In 1995, Kelston Boys High School played Palmerston North Boys High School and they won the game by 29. In fact, they played Wellington College, correction. They won the game by 19 to 10. And in 1996, Kelston Boys High School also won the top four and they beat Palmerston North Boys High School by 29 points to 11. Joe Schmidt, the Irish coach, was the coach of Palmerston North Boys High School. He returned to the final in 1997 and was the victim of a 41 3 shellacking from Wesley College, 41-3 being the record score and a top four final. In 1998, it was a draw between Rotorua Boys High School and Otago Boys High School. Craig Newbin, all black score for Rotorua Boys High School and the great saintly Sir Richie McCaw scored Otago Boys High School's only try oh, wow. in yeah. 1999. Take a breath. Kelston Boys High School beat Christchurch Boys High School by 21 points to 18. We enter a new <laughs> millennium and everybody's relieved out there. In the 2000 top four final, St. Peter's College won again by 19 to 10 against Wellington College. In 2001, the highest scoring of a top four final happened when Wesley College beat Rotorua Boys High School by 53 to 32 at North Harbour Stadium in Albany. Sir Vinnie Sibivatu and Stephen Donald played on the winning Wesley team that day. In 2002, it was another draw, six all between Napier Boys High School and Rotorua Boys High School. Liam Messon was the captain of Rotorua Boys High School that day. In 2003, the same two teams met in the final. And once again, it was Rotorua and Christchurch who prevailed by 31 to 11. 2004 was a 22 all draw between Christchurch Boys High School and Wesley College. Colin Slade played for Christchurch Boys High School and Sakopi who played number eight for Wesley. Oh, yeah. He went on to play nearly 100 tests for the Wallabies. In 2005, Christchurch Boys High School beat King's College by 23 points to 10. And Tim Bateman, the former Hurricane, was the captain of Christchurch Boys High School. In 2006, Auckland Grammar School was up at halftime but couldn't defeat Christchurch Boys High School. 18-14 to the Southern men. The last time the South Island won the top four was 2006. In 2007, Gisborne Boys High School was back on top of the summit. They defeated Mount Albert Ram School by 35 to 24. Some sources say 36 to 24. <laughs> Charlie Nartai scored 20 points that day for Gisborne Boys High School. That is a top four record. In 2008, one of the most remarkable results in top four history, Tawera Kerbalo, Captain Hamilton Boys High School, to a six-all draw against De La Salle College. De La Salle College, technically the national champions, because they scored first. In 2009, Hamilton Boys High School defeated St. Bede's College by 17 to nil. St. Bede's the only school to be held to naught in a top four final. 2010, Mount Albert Grammar School defeated Hamilton Boys High School by 20 points to 17. Mount Albert Grammar School scored four tries, missed six kicks, and still won the game. In 2011, Kelston Boys High School won their fifth top four. They defeated Wesley College by 24 to 14. In 2012, the final was in Pakaranga. And St. Kennekin's College defeated Otago Boys High School by 31 points to five. TJ Fayani was named Land Rover First 15 Player of the Year. In 2013, St. Kent's returned to the final and had their 51-game 
match winning streak snapped by Hamilton Boys High School. 12 10, the final score. Brim Gatlin, the son of Warren Gatlin, kicked the winning drop goal. 2014, a draw, 26 all between Scots and Hamilton. And Scots was up by 19 to nil. 2015, Scots back in the final against Rotorua Boys High School, their over 23 side. <laughs> and it was Rotorua who won by 36 to 27. And Isaac Tiardi, New Zealand Seamus player, scored two tries. 2016, Hastings Boys High School got awfully close to winning their first top four, but they were defeated by Mount Albert Grammar School 14 to 13. And Isaiah Papali'i now with the Auckland Warriors was the mm. Land Rover first 15 player of the year. Hastings Boys High School hit their time in the sun, though. The next year, they defeated Hamilton Boys High School by 25 to 17. And Kenny Naholo that season scored 41 tries in 20 games. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> Nearly there. <laughs> Nearly there. There's one more to go. And I've forgotten. No, I haven't forgotten. I'm just uh, winding no. everybody up. <laughs> and so the last top four final that he played in some time, there won't be one in 2020. But last year, there was a match between Hastings Boys High School and King's College. And it was Hastings who took the spoil by 27 to 15. If anyone can do better than that, I don't think there's many out there. But that is the ultimate rugby first 15 party trick. Adam Julian, he knows everything about uh, first 15 rugby, as you know. That is just exactly amazing. And that's why I'm still single. <laughs> Aren't we all? So, Adam, we uh, from tomorrow night, bars are open. That's going to be exciting. Um, and probably by May the 25th, we'll know a better detail about when local community rugby can start. Here's a suggestion. We could take the show around the Wellington club rugby scene to a club room. What do you reckon about that? Well, that'd be a lot of fun. We'd really appreciate the Wellington clubs to open their doors and have these two rapscallions inside. I, well, yeah, it's, it's right. Uh, essentially, this one, just keep the bar closed because, yeah. Took of this Jack Daniels. But thank you, Adam, for coming along. As always, it is absolutely fantastic having you here in the Huddy Fuddy for the Huddy Hooey. Uh, we will be back here next Wednesday at 8 o'clock. We have a very interesting guest. It's already been sorted. Look out for the ad tomorrow. It's got to be a beauty. Ciao for now. <laughs>